while Democrats in Washington tussle over their priorities and their strategy to pass President Biden's agenda, millions of Americans around the country are focused on empty shelves and sticker shock and wondering what the administration can do to fix it. Joining me now is Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, sir. We're going to get to those supply problems in a minute. But first, President Biden really raised the stakes this week when he went to Capitol Hill. He urged Congress to pass his agenda. He explicitly said the fate of his presidency hangs in the balance, and yet Democrats couldn't deliver. So why wasn't he able to close the deal with his own party? Well, look, we're the closest that we've ever been, and the president is confident that this framework that we're putting forward can pass the House and Senate and get to his desk for signature. The reason you hear this sense of urgency on his part, it's not just politics, it's that the country needs this. World leaders are gathering in Glasgow right now looking at this uh, chance that we have, and it's barely within our grasp now, uh, to be able to beat the worst effects of climate change. That means immediate action, and that's part of what's in this package. But also, families are ready for the support that has been lacking for a long time in this country, uh, to finally have preschool for every three- and four-year-old kid in this country, to extend that tax cut, uh, that tax credit, which means hundreds or thousands of dollars in the pockets of nine out of ten families uh, with, with kids in this country, uh, the urgency of making sure that uh, we, we make it easier to have a, a loved one who needs home care by cutting those wait lists. And we're talking about things what? that are going to make a real concrete and urgently needed impact in American lives, not to mention, of course, all those transportation infrastructure opportunities that I've been talking about all year that, that we have a chance to deliver right now. So you talked about a lot of, lot of uh, big changes that are currently still in this framework compromise. Uh, there is something that isn't, and that is paid family leave. You returned from paternity leave after welcoming your newborn twins, Penelope and Joseph. And I want our viewers to hear what you said on this show just two weeks ago about the importance of paid family leave. I campaigned on that, so did the president. The Build Back Better agenda includes provisions for paid family leave. It is long past time to make it possible for every American mother and father to take care of their children when a new child arrives in the family. So what do you say to the more than 100 million Americans who don't have access to the kind of paid family leave that, that you just benefited from and who don't understand why the administration didn't fight harder to keep it in the bill? Well, look, it, it's something that we believe in. Uh, I believe in it. Obviously, it's personal for me. Uh, the same is true for the president. Uh, and it's something that we'll continue pushing for. But let's talk about what is in this bill. Child care credit, uh, the uh, support, financial support for millions of American families to be able to get child care, in addition to free preschool for three- and four-year-olds, in addition to and, that child tax credit and, and, that, again, and, and, sir, is all of that is so, meaning all of that hundreds is important, of dollars and I'm a month. Not and I'm not taking it away from you, but when you say you're going to continue to keep fighting, how are you going to do that realistically when we're in, entering an election year and this was the vehicle on which the Democrats really felt was the most important, maybe the last chance to do it in the near future? Well, I'll tell you how we're going to do it. We're going to do it from a position of strength because when we pass this bill, we will have delivered the most important pro-family legislation of my lifetime, the biggest uh, expansion in health care since the ACA itself, the most we've done on climate change ever, and concrete improvements, literally, in roads, bridges, ports, airports, and so much more. When you have a successful policy, when you deliver major, positive, transformational change in the lives of Americans, you are rewarded with more running room to do more great things. I, I so, firmly believe that, that idea that good policy is good politics, and you, this framework is good policy. You know why it was dropped. It's because uh, Senator Joe Manchin uh, simply does not think that money should be spent on this in the way that it is being, was proposed. What do you say to him? Well, look, uh, again, I'm a, I'm a big believer in this policy, and, and I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I'm also a huge believer in the things that are in this bill in front of us right now. This is not half a loaf. This is a feast of good policies, some of which my party has been talking about, or even politicians on both sides of the aisle have been talking about, for literally as long as I have been alive. 
and the chance to deliver it is now within our grasp. It is an extraordinary package that is going to make concrete uh, improvements in the lives of every American, and I can't wait to see it done. Obviously, you know, when, when you put together something this big and this complex, nobody gets everything that they want. The president has been clear about that. I don't think anybody uh, crafting their perfect package in their mind uh, would see it reflected here because this reflects the input right. of so many different people, uh, including bipartisan work on the infrastructure side and a very ideologically diverse big tent party uh, on the, the family side. By the way, on the family stuff, yeah. I, I have to say, uh, I don't want to let Republicans off the hook. I think at least some of them should be able to vote for those tax cuts for middle class families. I think at least some Republicans should be willing to vote for three and four year olds to get preschool in this country. I think at least some Republicans should be prepared to vote for Americans to get up to a $12,500 discount on electric vehicles so that we can create American jobs so and beat climate change. Everybody should be part of the solution. Well. The Trump administration did uh, pass 12 weeks of uh, family leave for federal employees. But I want to move on, because you mentioned uh, infrastructure. I want to talk about the supply chain crisis. Two weeks after the Biden administration announced that key ports would move to 24-7 operations, supply chain backlogs are still really not getting much better. There are persistent truck driver shortages, warehouses are overflowing, an estimated $24 billion worth of goods are stuck waiting to go through U.S. ports. So how uh, are these going to be fixed? And do you expect these persistent delays to continue through the holidays? Well, we are going to continue to see challenges. The steps that we're taking are making a difference. But uh, think about all of the things that have to happen to get a product to a shelf uh, on time. Uh, fundamentally, it's up to the producers, the shippers, and the retailers. And we're doing everything we can to help them move those goods across uh, infrastructure that's often outdated. Look, we've got demand that's off the charts. The Retail Federation is predicting an all-time record high in terms of sales. We've got supply, which is, uh, in some cases, actually up but not up uh, enough to keep up with that demand. And then uh, the biggest thing of all, of course, you have the pandemic. <clears throat> the pandemic is poking holes in supply, no matter how good any company or any administration is. We're going to keep working on things like uh, the port issues, smoothing out anything else that is within our control. But the only way we can really put these disruptions behind us is to put the pandemic in the rearview mirror, which is why the president has been leading decisively to do just that. I want to ask before I let you go about a flight attendant for American Airlines who was hospitalized this week with a broken bone, several of them in her face, after a passenger assaulted her mid-flight. So far this year, the FAA is investigating more than 900 incidents of violent or unruly passengers, and that's up from 152 years ago. So should there be a federal no-fly list for people who behave like this on U.S. flights? I think that should be on the table. Look, uh, uh, it is completely unacceptable to mistreat, uh, abuse, or even disrespect flight crews. These flight attendants have been on the front lines of the pandemic from day one. And they're up there, uh, as the announcement always says, for your safety. Uh, there is absolutely no excuse uh, for this kind of treatment of, of flight crews in the air or any of the essential workers, from, uh, from bus drivers to, uh, to air crews, uh, who get people to where they need to be. The FAA stands strongly uh, with flight crews. It's why you're seeing some really harsh penalties and fines being proposed. And we will continue to look at all options to make sure that flight crews and passengers are safe. Before I let you go, it is Halloween. Did the twins have a costume or costumes? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, my, my uh, husband, Chaston, found these. Uh, it's a little hard to describe, but basically they're like these traffic cone costs. They're infrastructure, basically. They're going to be going as infrastructure. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg, of thank course. you so much for your time this morning. <laughs>